Okay, good morning. I'm Felix Ramos. It's for me a pleasure to present our next uh, keynote speaker. Uh, his name is Armen Sikodocian. He works in IBM. And today he is going to talk uh, about uh, Watson Studio and Auto AI. Uh, he is going to, uh, to deal with problem, or rather he is going to present how those tools uh, can help us to deal with um, accuracy and mainly uh, the, the, the problem that we have as human to interact with uh, cognitive machines. So please, Armin, uh, go ahead. You have time and that will be great for us to listen to you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Felix. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Let me start by sharing my screen. Share desktop. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Slideshow. Right from start. <clears throat> by the way, a thumbs up. Uh, everyone can see my screen just fine. Yes. Felix, excellent, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Move this one out of here. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, I must admit, um, this is not a research paper. Although artificial intelligence is the topic, not so much brain inspired. And that's okay. Hopefully you would find this a breath of fresh air. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's my primary audience in here. Um, are mostly in their 20s. They are uh, graduate students or undergraduate students who are excited about the field of data science and AI engineer, uh, who are thinking, what is it like to work at one of these giants, IBM, Facebook, Twitter, Meta? So I'm going to bring that sort of a approach, that sort of a mindset, uh, to the crossroads of these two disciplines, really. And also perhaps give you a little inkling of what it is that we are doing uh, at IBM, what are our mindsets in here. All right, let me minimize this. So this is what we're going to talk about today. The case of the missing bullet holes. A data science story before it was called data science. You know, when, when we're hiring, I interviewed data scientists at the IBM. There are, the first question isn't, do you know Python? No. What we're looking for are traits. Are you eternally curious? That's what I want on my team. Constantly is asking why. And can you tell stories? I want a storyteller. In this forthcoming hour, I'm going to be telling you a whole bunch of stories. You know, we have our data sets, we visualize them, and now we have to tell a tale of what it is that we discovered. And the case of the missing bullet holes begins us just fine. About cognitive systems, understand, reason, learn, and interact. Let's talk about those in more depth. From inferential statistics to calculus too. I, I really find it fascinating how given your data, starting from structured data and using things like logistical regression, SVM, random forest trees, at some point your parameters get to the point that just brute statistics is not enough. And we have to bring forth deep learning networks. All of a sudden, you know, my dean, I, I'm also a professor at two universities. I'm, I'm in Boston. So uh, one of them is 10 minutes away. The other one is uh, online. <clears throat> the, uh, my dean said, hey, I mean, uh, this is the computer science department. So you want students from engineering and computer science and so forth, right? I said, no, 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 no. The students that I would like, A, I want them to be from varied disciplines. You know, uh, I want them from the nursing school from the psychology department, architecture school. But the one thing that I really like to see in my students is a strong sense of statistics, first and foremost. That to me is the prerequisites to this discipline. Demo auto AI. Now I think perhaps the worth, the value in this talk might be 
in uh, showing you how this beast works. We're going to build and deploy a model. All of this in, in as little time as possible. And I love this final topic. I really hope we get a chance to talk about this after the demo. With live demos, you never know. You, know, it's, you click and you have to wait, we'll see. Um, but what does IBM think about artificial general intelligence? How far are we? Are we getting there? What work are we doing towards that? Really fascinating. Here we go. Abraham Wald and the missing bullet holes. Madame et Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, senores y senora, no, another one, Mabibi na Mawaba, let me take you back to World War II. It's funny now that I say this slide after the war that has happened, it has a different <laughs> connotation to it. But back then, uh, Allied airplanes, they would come and land in uh, England riddled with bullets, the fuselage, the wings, the tips, all the last. So the powers to be said, look, we, we have to reinforce these airplanes. Remember, this is World War II airplanes. Some of them are propeller and few of them are convertible. <laughs> can open the roof in the, up in the air. Uh, <clears throat> so we can't just put heavy metal all over the place. They knew of an Abraham Wald, a statistician. Oh gosh, tender age of 48. He founded the field of statistics and he spent some years at Columbia University. They said, Abraham, come help us. How do we do this? There he is. There's Abraham. He said, okay. So he did what uh, back then it wasn't even called data science, what a data scientist would do, gather data. So he went and started counting the bullet holes. See, he's counting them. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez, once, doce, endless. And then after two days of counting these bullet holes, he goes back to the powers to be, the generals and so forth, and says, I know where you can reinforce the airplane. Oh, really? Where? In all the places that do not have bullet holes. That do not have bullet holes. After all, they made it back. It's the ones with bullet holes elsewhere that didn't even get a chance to come and land in here. See, this sort of a prediction, this sort of a judgment is something that is elusive from the best AI systems today. Because what Abraham Wald had is experience, world knowledge, not just training. Very, very interesting. Let's see now how can we get close to the predictions that Abraham Wald made. <clears throat> See the data that we're talking about? This is the structured data, CSV file, Excel spreadsheet, and SQL calls you make from Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, IBM DB2, fantastic. Uh, the data scientists that work in the structured data area, they sit in the office, imagine I'm sitting in the office, and the boss comes and says, hey, I mean, uh, I want you to find out how come we're having employee attrition. Okay, I take the CSV file, I do some uh, analysis with it, and <clears throat> maybe bring up Jupyter Notebooks, do some, import some libraries, see some visualization. Fantastic. But the data scientist that's working in this area, I call it the modern data scientist, It's working in this area, <clears throat> has to wear a jacket to put on the coat, has to go outside, feel the weather, take measurements from the sensors, collect the images from the street cameras, bring them back. The data scientist that's working in this area is working with what it is that you don't know that you don't know. I, I love this concept. Uh, there are things that we know that we know how to be a sibling, a parent, a drive a car, the science and technology we're studying, how to cook food, we know what we know. And there are things that we know that we don't know. I'm a little bit murky about what happens uh, <clears throat> the, at the black holes there uh, with the event horizon and so forth. So I can, I can use a chatbot. I can ask, at least I have a question to ask. 
then there are things that I don't even know I don't know. I don't even have a question to ask. That's insight. That's what I want to, my data scientists to garner, to get from this section. Can you give me an example of what it is that you don't know that you know? That you don't know that you know. <laughs> I can't see the chat. I mean, I can open it, but too many windows in here. You know, well, fate, fate. For example, I might go up and I see this big door. I would open the door, but just no end, no end up there, no end. It's a big jump, big fall. I can't even see the bottom. And I'm going to say to my friend, I'm jumping. He's like, I mean, what do you mean you're jumping? He's like, no, if I jump, only two things will happen. Either I will learn how to fly or I will land on something soft. Well, really, do you have some data points, analysis? No, because I have faith. Interestingly enough, you could say that's a definition of faith. Really, really, really philosophical conversations one can have. This is very interesting, a brief history of AI and ML. Notice 1956, Dartmouth College, New Hampshire, three and a half hour drive from where I am. This is where artificial intelligence was coined. Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, uh, Alan Nuwa, you know, there, there were eight of them. They gathered and over a period of 10 days. They, they, they said, wait a minute, if this is how neurons work. They're firing on and off. There's always a potassium ion channel going on in my axon. And these are the dendrites, synaptic junctions back at the end. And uh, it's on and off. It fires and then it stops. <clears throat> How can we do this with code? Logistical regression came into play, for example. Some interesting things to, to note in here is the, the two uh, winters, the AI winter of this period. This mostly happened because computing power wasn't there to work with the math that was at, at play. There was another AI winter uh, around the 82, 83. And this is mostly because of government funding. It became like lost and it went away. And then work started again. Uh, over here, we had uh, the Jeopardy game, Gary Gasparov, uh, DARPA's Grand Challenge. Mm, this was really cool, 2011, Watson wins Jeopardy. I was involved with that, ladies and gentlemen. I've been at IBM for uh, 20 years now. It's funny enough when I, I talk to people and like, hey, John, how long you've been here? 10 years. Ah, you're a baby. <laughs> it's typical of most of us that uh, most people that I know that have been there close to a decade, plus or minus. It's a beautiful thing. So <clears throat> halfway through my tenure, that would have been 2011, the, uh, all of a sudden this Watson thing started at IBM. It was hard to get into that. You had to apply. It was like Senate grilling, that they would, the panel would sit there and they would ask you a question, <clears throat> big interviews and so forth, and either you got it or you didn't. <clears throat> I, I landed and I changed the division from asset management and I got into the Watson. And one of the annotators that I worked on was uh, IDF, Inverse Document Frequency, which had about that little bit work. Back then it was the UEMA pipeline unstructured information management architecture, monolithic big Java code. Now it's microservices and Python, everything is written in that. And, <clears throat> and the machine, the big engine that actually won the Jeopardy game was SPSS. There was no neural network there. There was no RNNs and uh, whatnot running. Uh, it, it, it was logistical regression. This is huge. Alpha Go, Alpha Zero, Google bought them. What an amazing purchase. This is reinforcement learning. This is when uh, uh, the, <clears throat> they went up to uh, Chinese authorities and said, hey, you have this game called Go game. There are as many moves in that game as there are grains of sand on earth. The white stones and black stones, and you have to capture the other with the other color. Don't leave a little stone empty because it can come out and go elsewhere. 
Well, the, the machine was never trained. This was not, a, that's reinforcement learning. It, it learned on the fly, an agent that gives it a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Yes, do that, no, don't do that. Project debater is huge, it's huge. We are getting close to the Alan Turing test. Still some ways away, but in here we're using generative networks, uh, frankly, uh, open AI. Elon Musk's company has some of the best uh, generative pipelines, adversarial pipelines. And we're using some of those to manufacture a sentence out of thin air, out of, out of the ether. So the, the system goes back into its corpus. Yes, it gets something from Al Jazeera, and then it gets something from the CDC and another passage from the Der Spiegel. But uh, the sentences in the middle, well, John, I see that you are trying to argue this point with me. Nobody typed that in in the dialogue. The machine fabricates sentences in, in between conjoining some fascinating stuff. Now, this is one way that we're thinking about the evolution in terms of representations. Uh, 80s, 1980s, expert system. Notice there was a rules-based engine, an if-then-else. There was a corpus, and some inference engine gave some sort of a prediction. In the uh, a few years later, these are single perceptrons mostly, support vector machines, decision trees, neural networks. <clears throat> Uh, task specific uh, handcrafted feature presentations. Fantastic. Deep networks came in. All of a sudden, now these are task specific learned features. We don't manually uh, adjust the features, but those weights, those hyperparameters, is adjusted by the system. Those back propagation is one such way of going about it. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, foundational models. This is what we work. <clears throat> uh, three uh, research facilities, one in Almaden, California, the other one in Zurich, and the other one in Haifa, Israel. <clears throat> we are putting a lot of emphasis in giving the machine common sense, trying to give the machine world knowledge. You have a base. It, it is a jack of all trades, but master of none. From there, it becomes easier to build a doctor, a lawyer. Well, not one that replaces the doctor or lawyer, but a second opinion. That's, that's our mindset. Mechanic for the hotel, concierge, suicide prevention, you, you name it. You know, the, big, the, the winner of the AI race, as we put it here at IBM, is not the country with the maximum information on their people. No. It's not the company or the university with the master algorithm. No, although usually it comes from universities. It is the one entity, the one corporation, the team that was able to do maximum AI with minimum data. This morning, this morning uh, when I woke up, first thing I do is usually have my glass of water. I didn't even have my glass of water. My feet hadn't even touched the floor. I was waking up. And I had a hunch that this is going to be a great day. Well, good luck to the machine with that much data trying to predict that it would be a good day. That's where we want to get to. About cognitive systems. Four things, understand, reason, learn, and interact. Cognitive systems, they need to understand like humans do. You know, when, when you build the chatbot, the brilliance, the, uh, the intelligence of the chatbot is not in the answer that it's giving you. It's in understanding your colloquial way of speaking with the accent. You know, they trained Watson on my accent, just on the accent. Uh, it needs to understand what it is that we're saying. I don't want the machine to come back and say, I'm sorry, would you please repeat that? These systems, they need to reason. Concept expansion, for example. You know, I might be looking for a um, document uh, research on color blindness. I tell you, color blindness. 20 million documents come up. Google now actually answers the questions, doesn't even just give you a link, it gives you a darn good answer. There's this one researcher in Johannesburg 
and she wrote her thesis, 450 pages, on the genetic mutation of the green and the red nodes in the back of the retina. Not once did she mention color. You just don't see the word color. Not once is the word blindness mentioned in this 450 pages. I, I might miss out on that document. I need a concept expansion to also bring that to my repertoire. Learning, these they never stop learning. And this should not be a surprise. Look at us. We're still learning. We're still continuing to, to expand our horizons. People think, oh, I bought an AI system. I'm good now. No, 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 no. You have to train this. Watson was a zero-year-old child. We got it to be a two-year-old child. The APIs that we have now, which I will uh, demo in a bit, they are already a two-year-old child. The thing is already trained on the entirety of the Wikipedia. So we don't have to start from zero when we build a chatbot. And of course, interact. You know, the Jeopardy game didn't interact. You know, there was input and output. I want the machine to say, yeah, but. Are you sure about that? You know, it needs to have an interaction to rebuttal, to debate my point of view. See, see how hard it is? Uh, typically, there's a strong affinity between nose and smell. You know, if I'm building n-gram, bi-gram, tri-gram in my NLP pipeline, uh, I make a strong affiliation, strong connection. The saliency of the weights between nose and smell is really strong. Now, all of a sudden, the human comes in here and says, my nose is running and my feet smell. Well, the machine needs to understand. Slim chance is exactly the same as a fat chance. <laughs> a wise man is so not the same as a wise guy. You know, it's, uh, this is why you can't just translate from English to German. Uh, Spanish and French, they have uh, male, female verbs. Chinese, Japanese, they're, they're symbols. If from the algorithm level up, it has to think in that grammar, in that construct. It's not just a matter of translating it. You want to make sense. <clears throat> this, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be child's play for you. Most of what I say in here for you would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for my audience that um, I'm hoping might enjoy this in, in their 20s who are aspiring to be masters of universe, you guys are already there. <laughs> this might be an interesting way to explain machine learning um, at its most plebeian level. Madame and Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, senores and senora, that is a hill. Hill. My job is to climb that hill. Hmm? So they come up to me and they say, Armin, I need you to climb that hill. I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. I can do this. Oh, yeah, not so fast. I'm like, what? What do you mean? You have to do it blindfolded. Where's my Jamaican bandana? Boy, there it is. And you have to get there as minimum steps as possible. I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I'm amongst friends. So they cover my eyes and I start bum, 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 going up. I notice it's a steep hill. Slope is learning rate. My eyes are closed. Machine learning is blind. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing where the slope is changing. See, this is a different slope. This is a slightly different slope. This is a slightly different slope. The machine knows, or I would know that in here, uh, the tangent of uh, or those coordinates, that's a tangent of whatever it might be, is equal to zero. Remember sine, cosine, tangent. So I have I have reached a plateau. Either I go down or I go up from here. But because when I first started, my gate was really huge. So I go past it. Not optimized. Forward feed. Now I do a back propagation. Let's do this again. That didn't work out. So I start off on a smaller scale step. It's taking me three weeks to get up there, not optimized. 
These steps are actually the weights, the hyperparameters. And when you start off on a machine learning project, typically you might go to NumPy and say, randomly select a weight, a hyperparameter. From there on, I can adjust it. So when I first start, it's okay to have the wrong step. I'm going to do a back propagation, come back and redo it back and forth, back and forth. That's why NVIDIA Corporation came up and said, you guys are still using CPUs? I think you need the GPU for this to do your math. The NVIDIA stock run. Now each company is building its own uh, neuromorphic chips. The one in IBM is called North Star. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a glob, actually. It's a blob. Uh, germanium telluride it's um, it's uh, it's a phase shift so the signal doesn't just go on a wafer it can go up it can go in the three-dimensional way uh, the gates now are at seven nanometers that's two atoms thick the signal gets lost in silica really really fascinating the, uh, uh, the moore's law is is really being challenged now <clears throat> so that that's really if I knew what the uh, curvature changed uh, the the slope, then my learning rate would get to slope. So all of a sudden, how do we calculate slope derivatives? Hmm? And this typically might be a three dimensional uh, uh, setting. So I need to calculate the area under my curve. How do we calculate area under the curve? Those are integrals. So it's really interesting to, for me to reveal to my students how you would go from a statistical approach, good old logistical regression, to a part where you actually need to bring in a bit of a calculus. Let's, let's continue. Right. Slide show, play from current slide. Machine learning is blind. Ah. This is the simplest, I've seen some brutal uh, uh, formulas in the past two, three days. They, they most of them made me go woozy. This one is the simplest formula there is. Method of least squares, this is a machine prediction formula. I want this line to be a best representative of all these dots. Best representative. So <clears throat> I know what the uh, Y is. Tac, 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 tac. There it is. Thank you. Now. What is, where is y hat? How can I calculate y hat? Wait, y hat actually is calculated by mx plus b. Mm -hmm. b is my intersect to the y axis. This is, it could be zero if it went to. Uh, to the bottom, it could be zero. <clears throat> M is my slope. I know what X is. How, what, what is my slope? What usually it's Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1. Hmm? You might say that's the derivative. So as long as I can find out, now the trick in here, the trick in here, let me do a little Picasso for you. New slide and a perhaps a better looking color. Thank you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I shall succeed, I am confident. Format background. Thank you very much. So back to our Picasso here. <clears throat> so let's say I have a distribution. Again, I apologize if this is boring. A lot of the masters of the universe, but that's that's fine. It's it's again my targeted audience of 20-something year old might find this interesting. Ooh, I also have an outlier in here. So my job is to come up with a line that really best, actually, I don't want to use that one. Let it undo. Uh, design is good one. Uh, insert is good one. Insert. 
Hmm? So now all of a sudden, Felix is going to come and say, Armen, I don't think this is a really good representation. You see that outlier, we decided the outlier was a good thing. You actually need to move this a little bit like that. Hmm. And then Howard would come and say, no, 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 no. Not just that, you actually need to move the entire curve. Yes, both of them, both of them. So when we, typical multi-perceptron in here, the activity that takes place inside the hidden layer, that's the statistics. That's the logistical regression, ReLU or parabolic tangent. This is what moves, is what moves the whole curve. The activity that's taking place on the neuron, this lighting here, and on the, not the neuron, but really the, the synapse, is what's actually helping the slope to change. I have to be fair for all these dots that I have. I have to be fair for all those sections and segments that I have. <clears throat> the, you might say, well, what, what does take place in here? Lots of things, lots of things. Back to my Picasso. Uh, each layer might do a different bias detection. Bias moves the whole line, the curve, weights, changes the slope. Sure, we have an S curve. I remember S curve, one over one plus e to the minus x. Anything to the minus x is same as writing one over e to the x. That's an x. That's an x. Mm -hmm. or, or it could be parabolic tangent, perhaps. Maybe another layer would use this as a bias. Uh, the one that we use most often is ReLU, rectifiable linear unit comes in the middle and then straight line, linear unit. It could be sticky or whatnot. These are the various constructs, statistical constructs that lurk within these nodes, not neurons. That does injustice to what God created, nodes, <clears throat> that help to make a better prediction. And of course, the weight that we assign to it arbitrarily is a randomly chosen number, three. Good, bad, right, wrong, doesn't matter. When it goes through a whole bunch of back propagation, this might come back and be 2.9. Maybe that's our 2.978, who knows? Again and again and again, until my prediction and my actual are start to become closer and closer. <clears throat> back to our regularly scheduled programming. <clears throat> ah, this is interesting. So, so, you know, machine learning has uh, there's supervised and unsupervised reinforcement. Those are the most common ones. The reason I picked this particular slide is because it is a telltale sign of the sort of problems we're trying to solve with our quantum machine. It's really, it's really fascinating the work that IBM is doing with quantum machine. It's not that we're replacing classical systems. You still need a classical system. But once you get into a quantum machine, the speed the, uh, in, in which it can solve big problems. Some people say that um, quantum machine is a solution looking for problem. <clears throat> well, simulating nature is one such challenge. Simulating the caffeine molecule is one such challenge. Understanding the protein for COVID is dead. It's a protein. You know, it's just, it's not the DNA, it's an RNA. Uh, how else might it mutate six months from now? So you almost need to model all the amino acids that go into that protein. How, how cool would it be for me to come up with a vaccine for a future variant that doesn't exist today? That's where we're using our uh, quantum machines. Lighting here. <clears throat> so supervised learning, classification and regression. All right, classifications, we, uh, identity fraud detection, image classification, customer retention, diagnostics. With regression, we can have weather forecasting, 
market forecasting, estimating life expectancy, you know, Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, these are the ones that come into play uh, in, in trying to make that, help that prediction, especially when your hyperparameters are just endless in billions, literally. And of course, then there's the unsupervised learning. Clustering is the favorite in unsupervised learning and the type of challenges that a quantum machine algorithm, right now the algorithms for quantum machine are somewhat like uh, the early days of, uh, they're like Fortran, the early days. They're, <clears throat> they do one thing and they do one thing good. Uh, dimension reductionality, uh, data visualization, for example, comes from that structure discovery especially with uh, biomedical engineering, uh, meaningful compression, clustering, of course, recommender systems, uh, targeted marketing, customer segmentation. These are really the sort of approaches that we want to introduce our quantum machine to, to be able to handle some of these amazingly broad and huge problems. This is an interesting one. First, there were websites, now apps, soon bots. You know, uh, let me go back here. Uh, our kids, let me see, would it be our kids? No, I think our kids' kids. My boys are in their 20s now. So uh, probably later on, maybe, in the, but uh, when, when, they, when they have a, when they end up making me a grandfather, I'm ready. I'm ready and telling you I'm feeling it, but <laughs> it's going to be a while, I think. <clears throat> they're going to say, yeah, they're going to come up and say, Papa, what's an app? I don't know what an app is. What do you mean download an app? Never heard of it. See, it comes to the point that uh, where's my phone? I left it in the other room. You know, these are bots that are doing brokerages amongst themselves. The restaurant bot is working to the weather bot. He's talking to the golf string. I don't have to download Lyft, Uber, double authentication, put the credit card number in there. I just want to pick up my phone and say, get me a car. Oh, and uh, reserve me a restaurant at the Chateau restaurant near the fireplace. Oh, and is the weather front moving in right now? Can I, uh, or is the golf course open? I don't have an, anything installed really from any of these entities that and they're api providers you need this is the api economy but there's a brokerage there's bots that are doing the negotiation amongst themselves nothing downloaded no apps one-to-one -one versus one-to-many you know this approach of yell and sell does not work anymore i won't chat and listen some years back i was in the market for an automobile so, you know, you get uh, a little bit more sensitive to car advertisements and this and that on TV. And they were like, come on down and buy a Toyota pickup truck. Everyone was saying that. I'm like, I don't want a Toyota pickup truck. I want my twin turbo V10. What would mean a Toyota pickup truck? If, if you chatted and listened to me, I will come to your dealership and I would buy it from you. <clears throat> well, small data versus big data. <clears throat> Bye bye, Hadoop. <laughs> I want small data. I want chunkable, actionable small data that I can immediately, with that minimum information, make a maximum prediction. Always on versus always perfect, the real and the raw. My dears, you may remember some years ago there was the Boston Marathon bombing. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> The way they found out those uh, two brothers uh, was actually they used neural networks. The, the cameras on Newberry Street, down here, on Newberry Street, they, they depicted humanoids, man, woman, white, black, doesn't matter, earthlings, looking that way eastward, with a bit more, uh, perhaps, definition you might see, august faces. But it doesn't matter. These aren't high-definition cameras at all. Some blah, 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 and there, two of those humanoids were looking this way, westward. Time series LSTM, bit, and, and those two other anomalies, they're outliers, they're anomalies, had something black in their back, and two streets later, they don't. The backpack. Oh, 
I don't know what they are, but it's an outlier. It's an anomaly. Is the video high definition HD 4K? No, but it is always on. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. oh, I love this. Brute statistics versus artificial neural networks. So the, the, the look and comparing these two are, are really interesting. Regression takes the data and tries to find the result that minimizes prediction mistakes, maximizing goodness. I want to make my line the best fit with all those dots that are scattered around it. No, regression, to regress, right? To look back, that's what regress is. Do you guys know this joke? No? Make sure I have enough time for my, ah. I may want to start my demo quicker than I thought. A physician, an engineer, and a statistician, they go on a hunting trip. Here in Massachusetts, we don't have guns. We do bows and arrows. And uh, so the physicist goes, I got this. Sees a deer up front. I got this. Calculates the curvature of the earth, the tension of the elastic. Uh, goes, misses the deer by five meters to the left. The engineer says, no, man, you got to take the wind into consideration. And does one of these, calculates the wind. And says, I got this. Misses the deer by five feet to, to the right. This was left to the right. The statistician doesn't even bother to pick up the bone arrow. Stands in the middle, goes, hurrah, we got it. Used <laughs> to be fun. Being precisely perfect on average can mean being actually wrong each time. Regression can keep missing several feet to the left or to the right, even if it averages out to be the correct answer. Regression means never actually hitting the target. Unlike regression, machine learning predictions might be wrong on average, but when they miss, they don't miss by that much. Inventing a new machine learning involves proving it works better in practice. Inventing a regression improves that uh, it works in theory. This one, you sit in the office, a CSV file comes to you, and you run some hypothesis on it. This one, you gotta go outside and you're gonna feel the cold and the hot and the sun and the sweat and everything. Machine learning has less need to specify in advance what goes into the model and can accommodate the equivalent of much more complex models with many more interactions between variables. That's why now, you know, the, no one's really coming up with a brand new algorithm. They're, they're building up an existing algorithm, capsule networks, for example, generative networks, adversarial networks. Uh, CNNs, no, you can't even use a CNN now due to the uh, diminishing returns. Now there's our CNN, kind of has that feedback loop that uh, the current neural networks has. By the way, I stole this from this book called Prediction Machines. This book is mandatory reading for my students in both of my colleges. So Wentworth Institute of Technology, WIT, here in Boston, and the other one on Monday nights, it's in uh, Kentucky, the University of the Cumberlands. I'm a professor in both of those, nighttime job, three jobs. Uh, amazing book, amazing book, uh, Prediction Machines. You just love, especially if you like economics, it has an economics flair to it. And now the demo, Watson Studio. Shall we do this, my dears? Let's 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 begin. And I'm hoping we can do the because uh, I want to come back and talk about our machines going to replace me. That's such a philosophical conversation. But I want you to see, and let's connect here, our auto AI at work. Ah, there we go. This. Ladies and gentlemen, if I was working in Microsoft, the name of this would be Azure. If I was working at Amazon, the name of this would be AWS. Google calls it Google Cloud, we call it IBM Cloud. It's funny, this 20 years I've been IBM, I've seen the demise of the products and the rise of the APIs. Our tech sellers, all of a sudden, you don't know what to do. They used to go set up the three-tier architecture, database in the basement, application server in the middle, the asset management application in the top floor. Now, now it's pay as you go. 
20 cents. You click 20 cents. You have to become Lego builders and put these things together. Our catalog is where, I, th I think of the catalog as the Mall of Dubai. I don't know if you've been to the Mall of Dubai. You can buy everything there. That's the catalog. The ones that I am most familiar with, do come in storage, networking, containers, integration, boom, boom, I These are my children, these 19 over here. I'm going to go in there. What's an assistant? That's how you build a chatbot. Watson Studio is the one we're going to go in now. Watson Studio is more of an IDE, integrated development environment. It is friendly with all these other ones. You can bring them in structured, unstructured, and so forth. And Jupyter Notebooks, our studio, model building, so forth. Well, it's lots of fun. And there's lots of good things. Speech to text, text to speech. Open scale is about fairness. Was there bias in the algorithm or was there bias in the data? Why didn't you give loan to this person? Hmm? Really, really interesting. So far. All right, let's begin. I'm going to click Watson Studio. <laughs> Many locations. I am closest to Dallas. I'll stay with Dallas. And I have read and I agree. This is free. So for universities and stuff, we have uh, you can access this for free. I don't want any errors. Just a simple get this going. Thank you. I tell my students, if you see something blue, click it. Don't read. Do you see something blue here? Click it. <laughs> oh, it's provisioning it. In other words, it's now it's building a NoSQL database. So I can bring in unstructured data. The provision, what's in there? No, 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 I, I, I got this, I got this. I want a new one. Thank you very much. Project uh, uh, view all uh, new project. Thank you. New project, empty project. Thank you. We're going to give it a name. Bika 2022. Mm -hmm. Or uh, another you know, the data set we're going to work with is about uh, loan fraud. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, I already had an object storage, so it, it's uh, uh, from the list. Fine, put that one. <laughs> so um, I really. This is what we're going to do. Told you about the. I'm going to go open up uh, one of my projects in here, resource list. I bet you that's because I had it on for running for so long. It looks like my internet is also. By the way, can you guys hear me well? Is my is my uh, is my uh, voice becoming too? Uh, oh, look at all this reflection from here. It's a lot. Too much reflection from it. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Everything okay? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Resource list. Go, go, let's go to the dashboard. I was hoping for no surprises. I want no surprises. Um, I have 72 of them. I'm going to open up my old Watson Studio that I had here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let me put something in here to stop the reflection coming in. Table, crazy. What's in studio? Studio, I'm seeing it. I was working with. Uh, Anand the other day, that's, we'll go there. You see blue, you click it. Not yet, not yet. Or the project, empty project. 
Maybe this is a new one. I wonder if there's something go uh, right. Mm -hmm. Cloud object storage, yes. Okay. Here are docs. Mm -hmm. There's another idea. Cloud object. Object storage. Thank you. I'm going to create a new one. What do you mean? And one more try. Let's see if I have one that's already running. Another phase. Each time on a nice new demo, it uh, decides to do this thing. So <clears throat> if this gives us, give me another uh, uh, problem, I'm going to go back to our presentation. It's in studio. The latest one, fundamentals, maybe that. Cancel. I'm going to open, uh, see if this one. Assets. Okay, this is the one that I want you to work with. Credit German risk. I used the one that I did a month ago. It looks like it's not yelling at me. Let me show it to you. So this is a typical bank, USB bank, UBS bank. And um, it's collected uh, data. You know, uh, what was the checking status of the person? How long was their loan duration, their credit history, loan purpose? What was the loan amount? Did they have existing amount, employment, so forth and so on. And interestingly, at the end, we have our training column. And I like it how it's not one and zero, risk, no risk. So this is training set. The answers are provided. Let's say this This actually is a, from the Kaggle competitions, this particular uh, German credit data bias training. Uh, they use it in Google competitions. It used also a lot with detecting bias and so forth. So we want to see which one of these kind of uh, characteristics. We're not after people. This is not, you know, name, social security number is removed. What kind of a characteristic trait might lead someone not pay their loan back? All right. <clears throat> and um, oh, I had the notebook in here. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's create a new asset. I'm going to find... Uh, Connections, parameter uh, setting, Jupyter Notebooks, SPSS, Appliance Data Replication. Data Refinery, Pipelines, Parameter. So, so Auto AI, all of a sudden, <clears throat> and this, of course, <clears throat> it allows you to save it as a notebook projects. <clears throat> Try one more loan for see where's my auto AI. Data tab, new asset. Repeat it in pipelines. I don't think so, my dears. <clears throat> Alas, 
I lost, I couldn't get to show you the auto AI. It's such an amazing thing. It's welcome to live demos. I'm, to, I'm going to take you back to here. And uh, once, once I get that, I think I have uh, a demo on it. Actually, I can, I can show you the demo exactly on it. Uh, if you go to uh, <clears throat> LinkedIn, I have it on my LinkedIn. <clears throat> That's me. You. Mm -hmm. Alas, I don't have a few minutes to 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 stop. And tell me if you got the answer right or wrong based on the study that you did in Pacifier. The one wasn't enough. Gradient boost. This this book has it even checked. Gradient boost classifier. Light gradient boost. Not just. So yeah, I, I do speak colloquially in this video, but notice the, the system brings up its own uh, uh, algorithms. It decides. You can then save it as a Jupyter notebook and bring in your personal algorithm, but the system decides what it is that it wants to bring in. This was the same uh, Excel spreadsheet that we were looking at. And <clears throat> uh, no risk was the column that I selected as my x-axis. All the other ones were y-axis. This is the predictable column. <clears throat> selected the algorithms. Or let the machine go with what it uh, reckons would be the best. Uh, you can have a number of pipelines. Two means the machine will select two of these. Three, it means it will select, we don't tell it. It, it looks at the data set and says, I'm going to use random forestries, logistical regression, and XGB classifier, extreme gradient boost. Fine. Looks like I picked two in this example. And then we uh, say, okay, I want a, a threefold you know, a, a test, train, and then you, you train it on a set, you hide maybe 10% of it. Here, we, we hit 10% of it and test on that one, supervised learning. Uh, <clears throat> and in here, you have an opportunity to maybe uncheck some things. Maybe there's a, it, it shows you all the columns. These are the same columns. It, it allows you under the data source to say, you know what, this says social security number. No. Address, no. Uncheck it. Telephone number, no. Uncheck it. This is a pretty cleansed data, so we used most of them. And then we click, we, we click really, it says there's no coding going on in here. And it starts to build with the two pipelines. It picked the gradient boosting in here. So it went through, read the data set, split uh, processing and so forth. And one of the pipelines ends up getting the star. All the, it becomes the winner. It's the one with the highest accuracy. So we select, we do a click in that one. It's, it's continuing, looks like this one now did better. And what we look at, you know, I tell my students, know the confusion metrics, know how to connect uh, using the confusion metrics to calculate accuracy, recall, precision, through positive, false positive, through negative. These are the lingos that, that you hear a lot in our data science department. And this is a receivable operating curve. False positive is the x-axis and true positive is the y-axis. This is giving me, it's like the F1 score. It's giving me of a, how well advanced it is. And who knew? Uh, loan amount, this is 0.999%. Age, loan duration, 59% possibility that somebody may not pay their loan back if loan duration is of concern. Age seems to be even higher. These, these new features it does of uh, <clears throat> feature engineering, adds and multiplies, and sine, cosine of checking status, that's 37% and so forth. And it goes down really, really 
fascinating how it uh, it does the trick for us. Google has something called uh, Auto AI that they requires a little bit more command prompt. This one is really nicely UI driven. I ask my students to put in their own CSV file. <clears throat> Find the CSV file, us.gov, and come up with predictions. And that, that becomes their final project. Uh, I, alas, I have very few minutes left, but I'm going to take them. Are machines going to replace me? Slideshow, play from current slide. Human advantages over machines. Prediction relies on data. That means we have two advantages over machine. We know things that machines don't, world knowledge, not yet anyway. And we are better at decision making when there isn't much data. Ask Abraham Wall or me when I woke up this morning and I knew it was going to be a great day. I didn't know the demo would give me a bit of a <clears throat> conundrum here, but after 20 years of running demos, you kind of expect everything. Humans have three types of data that machines don't. You know, uh, <clears throat> touch is coming. Runners are wearing these gloves. But as they get close to a different runner, or if they get close to a tree, it vibrates differently. And usually uh, the blind runners, they, they run with a partner, with a coach. It's really interesting. Smell, well, you know, uh, if the machine, you know, I'm sitting in here. Ah, I am so hungry. That's a great food coming from the kitchen. Can the machine do that? If it did, I would have a lab on it. We are the final arbitrators of our own preferences. This is huge. This is huge. Dear machine, thank you for your prediction. I will be the judge. You tell me it's going to rain tomorrow, but don't tell me to pick up my umbrella. I have this special hat that I'd like to wear. I'm going to wear that one. Man, the sun is reflecting like crazy from top of this table. I didn't know about that, did you? How's that? A little bit better? I'm sure. <clears throat> Privacy concerns, they restrict the data available to machines. As long as enough people <laughs> keep their sexual activity, financial situation, mental health status, and repugnant thoughts to themselves, the AI system will have insufficient data to predict behavior. <laughs> <clears throat> And I stole that from this book. AI enables a partnership between human and machines. We excel at morals, imagination, compassion, judgment, and common sense. There actually, there's nothing common about common sense, I'm afraid. The machines are really good with pattern identification. You know, it's the if then else that the machine is good with. I'm like, if I leave now, the traffic should be less. I should be able to pick up my sister by 4.30. That gives me 15 minutes to get to the flower shop. Ah, I might be late to pick up my dad. If then, if then, if then, mm. but not the machine. Goes through a tree structure, comes up with the, uh, the traveling salesman problem. That's where you need a quantum machine, the optimization. <clears throat> comes up with the best route that I can do to pick up everyone and not be late. The machine does better than I do with my if then else. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is a great story. I want to end with, with this story. Artificial narrow intelligence. That's where we are now. The best of self-driving car, Google. It really does one thing and one thing good. Now we call it artificial broad intelligence. You can have a bunch of narrow ones together. I'm waiting for the automobiles to communicate with one another. Right? You, you, I'm glad it's a level two, level three autonomous driving car, but can you talk to the other car? Hey, hey I'm coming, watch out. <laughs> this, Madame and Monsieur, Madame and Herren, Senores and Senora, is the big thing. I have experienced that. I have experienced it. A rudimentary version of it, I will tell you. This is before COVID. Back then, we used to travel a lot. Back then, uh, my travel points at the Hilton Hotel, I would come into the Hilton, they would say, Senor, IBM, por favor, pasar. Now it's, they, 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 they put me in the boiler room. I used to get the top corner, sit in the front of the plane. <laughs> no more points, but that's okay. During that era, I was invited to uh, 
uh, to Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, the robotics department. The first thing I did when I got there, I said, was it? Was it? But I knew the tooling. If you're one page ahead, it's not that. So I was to run a workshop. I went into the robotics department and the, uh, the reception receptionist was a robot, not a humanoid robot. No, it, it had one lens in here. There was a, a screen up in here. Uh, the legs were uh, uh, just a part, one part, and a tractor wheels, with tractor wheels. I went in, I'm like, uh, hello. Hi, Armin, welcome. Facial recognition had my uh, uh, bio, and it knew that I had about my meetings. Not hard concepts. Uh, later on, they told me, had I gotten there early, would have asked if I wanted to go to the cafeteria for refreshments, but... So I'm like, uh, I have a meeting with John. Where's John's office? Sure, Armin, follow me. Okay, follow the robot. It's going down with the tractor wheels. The, the pod is turning greener. I'm colorblind, red, green. I don't know what they're doing. But I, I could tell it was changing color. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm following it. It went by the elevators. And one of these AI engineers she kicks a chair in front of the machine. No, no facial expression, very stoic. Just kicks a chair in front of the machine. Machine stops, easy. Laser, leader, sonar, monar, it stops, no problem. I stopped us, same thing. The machine goes around the chair, leaves the chair in front of the elevator. I did the same thing, left the chair there, we looked at her, no emotions, nothing. I went around it. We got to the Jones office. It's telling me five meter, we turn left, three meter, and we turn right. Okay, cool. We got to John's office. John asked the machine two questions. Hard for human, let alone for, for a machine. What happened at the elevator? Why were you late? Oh, it answered them. It answered them. The machine is gaining experience. It's not just training, it's different. We're working on this in our Almaden Research Laboratories in California, it's called Embodied Cognition. Ah, huge. Uh, ASI, it's not here yet. Here, quick example on the ASI. Today, I might ask Watson, Watson, can you tell me about black holes? And Watson might say, um, I'm sorry, our man. Uh, I don't know about black holes. Perhaps you can teach me. I'm like, okay, eat this PDF <laughs> and that website. Now it knows about black holes. On the day of ASI, it will know the black holes anyway, but the answer might be like this. Watson, can you tell me about black holes? I'm sorry, Armen. I know that I don't know about black holes. Self-awareness. This is when they get together they move to a community, they elect a representative, they come into the city in the daytime, clean the streets, there's no automobiles, there's no parking lots, there's no car insurance, there's no speeding ticket, there's no meters. They take us, they move us from here to there, there's no front or back to these pods, they come and clean the house, cook the food, some of them stay back at night to do policing, and uh, they go back to their own uh, section. <laughs> this is my last slide. Uh, AGI, this is according to um, Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil, he's at Google now. He founded an amazing university, the University of Singularity in uh, San Jose, in uh, <clears throat> NASA Ames Research Laboratories. I went there twice. Amazing, amazing. Uh, first of all, you have to go through 20 gates and five IDs, and then you go into NASA research area. There's so many startup companies that have to do with space. I love space. And uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden, there's this building, Singularity University. In the back, you can see a big hangar, you know, like the Zeppelin ship, that uh, airships. Uh, it's, it's for that. It's for testing airships. Google has rented that now. They're using it. Uh, the classes start at, um, what, what time did they start it? They started at 10 a.m. and they finished at 10 p.m. six days a week. 
10 months master's degree. 83 students there, two of them were from America. <clears throat> Government had sent them from Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, from really on, on everywhere. And they, they, their mandate is to solve a world problem. Or quite a thing. The food in the cafeteria. I'm like, what is this? He's like, yeah, we feed the brain. So anyway, Ray Kurzweil is the one that made this prediction, who created that university. 2040, will I be here? 2040? Yeah, yeah, I think I'll see this. I think I'll see this. I'll probably bug out over here. Happy to say I won't be here for that. And that would be very, very interesting. Madame and Monsieur, I'm so sorry the the <clears throat> demo was giving me hard times but i was able to at least show you somewhat from that youtube uh, how auto ai worked nine minutes past the hour any thoughts comments questions sorry sorry now um no, we have no much time so if someone has uh, some question please uh, let your hand i can see okay here the audience has a question no okay did you, did, you uh, did you did you enjoy it did you get something out of it or did you want no, to was uh, was okay uh, it, it was great your presentation and um, i have a question uh, in resume what do you think about uh, the interaction between human and cognitive uh, computers, cognitive machines? Mm -hmm. uh, we hope, we trust that the cognitive machines will be a, a second opinion to the humans in every facet. Uh, we don't want it to be a lawyer but it wanted to be the library that would find out for the actual lawyer what case happened in 1974 that he didn't know about that he can use here. We want the cognitive system to be a second opinion to the doctor. You know, after a while, if you look in here, I'm like, doctor, is this cancer or okay? Well, well let me take a picture of it. And if the machine uh, has gained the trust of the doctor over the years, and with 97% says, this is a, a, a sunspot, it's benign, it's not cancer. So the doctor can go and then maybe just take a little uh, uh, a biopsy. I don't have to go through surgery and all this to recover. Uh, sorry, sir, we didn't have to do surgery. That, that little bump in here was nothing. Couldn't you have determined earlier and, and made this easier instead of all that? So we're looking at cognitive systems as machines that can do really good prediction with minimum data. I don't want to spend months training this. Minimum data. Don't give me 50 pictures, two pictures, and I wanted to know that this is the same guy. And the, the, that's really the mindset we have for cognitive systems to know. Okay, and now that you uh, are talking about prediction and small sets, um, don't you think that uh, the way we are working with computers is uh, is missing something? Because we as humans, uh, we make decisions with the very, very small sets of data. So uh, it's, it's rather something that to know how to choose the right set of data, the right set of uh, parameters or, or something like that, uh, because uh, the amount of uh, computation that we need today to make a computer cognitive is huge. So uh, 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 what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful question. Yes, it's, 
you know, how can you say minimum data? A machine needs data. It needs food for it to predict. And you want to give it two pictures and have the same thing. That's that's the the plan is to work on that foundational level now. It's it's the next level in artificial intelligence, where you have uh, capsule networks, generative and adversarial networks, coming to bear and giving the system uh, common sense, if you would. Once you have that as a base platform for all cognitive systems, now you start to sell the product, not before it. Now you go to the hospital and say, it's easy. I can make this a doctor in two days because it already knows a lot of things. So for that minimum data to become a realization, the machine needs to already start from a maestro level with a base, broad, general world knowledge. Uh, not a master of universe, but also not a two-year-old either. Once you get that into place, then it's much easier to give the machine two pictures of me and say, who's that third per picture? And with a 97% confidence to say it's the same guy, not 64% confidence. Felix, did, that, uh, did I answer the question at all? Or, Yes, uh, I think I have another question. And um, don't you think that the, the level of abstraction that we are using in computer is very low? So they need to, to, to make a lot of processing to, to answer uh, or to give uh, uh, an answer to all requirements. Uh, and that... Uh, I, I'm not sure. What do you think about the, the meaning or, or the level of abstraction that we are using in computers? Uh, I think in computers, in a cognitive system, uh, we are using knowledge, not data. Cloud machine data, you said? Yeah. Cognitive information. Uh, we, we have knowledge, nor just data. That's why we are uh, doing the, the, the computers and uh, make a lot of processing. Because we are still far from a cognitive system. We, we are still very, very far. We don't know how uh, to determine a context uh, that is uh, essential to try to solve a specific problem. And it means that we are not dealing with the correct uh, information or we are dealing in different uh, level of abstractions. So what do you think about that? Yes, yes, that, that is a elusive problem that's haunting all AI systems. That hasn't gone away. Um, there is a possibility that if I can get a quantum machine to work with a classical machine, then I can actually bring in a billion parameters. Right? That's past human level of abstraction. But I need that, what the human does, in, in a picosecond, I can come up with some sort of an abstraction based on very paltry information, not the machine, not the machine. But if the machine can take the hand of a quantum system, now it gets close to where I am. And that's where I want the machine to be, to lead to, lead to that level of confidence based on such a <clears throat> paltry level of abstraction that almost it had to put together and I couldn't even give it. So it is, it is a ways to go. It is ways to go to, to get to that level, but uh, we are seeing advances. There was danger of a third uh, winter of AI. And guess who saved us? Elon Musk with open AI. The algorithms over there were the ones that basically averted the generatives and the uh, discriminators. We're the ones that were able to give a new life 
to uh, uh, cognitive computing. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Armen. Yeah, and thank you very, very much for your talk. And I think we, are, we ought to continue. It will be a pleasure to continue talking about this uh, fascinating uh, area of research. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And now we...